So for this episode of green screen readings, I'm not actually reading anything. This one is just a bunch of wasted potential episode ideas I've had, and I'm basically never going to end up making. Some because I just don't have the interest in it anymore, or because it wasn't much of a solid idea for a full video. In some cases, it's because I don't remember what the concept was. I had this period where I was coming up with loads and loads of ideas for the episodes, and then it'd be like, oh, okay, make a thumbnail. But I wouldn't write down what the idea was. Because I guess I figured I could just remember what the ideas were, but then I came up with so many of them that the ideas get, get getting pushed back, and so I don't remember what most of these are. So I'm here to basically explain what some of these ideas would have been. As, as it currently stands, there are 43 of these thumbnails. While originally I was going to go through this whole thing as just go through them in random order, I realised because a few of them are comic book based early on, I've made this one the comic book episode. So I'm going to divide it into different ones. It'll be a game one, and, and which will have one of the parts of this I already recorded, or two of them, and I'm going to try and theme it more than rather than just doing random bits, probably. We'll see. And so right here we have Lady Thor, Jane Foster. So this was basically around the idea that when Lady Thor was introduced, because of the mystery behind her, kind of all there really was to it was, it's just a female Thor, who is she? And then we find out it's Jane Foster. Once that mystery is revealed, like, what really is there other than, I mean, she has the vulnerability of being this cancer patient, which is not got the hammer which is something different but when you have these successor characters you want them to have something different you want them to be familiar you know you don't want a new spider-man to be radically different like completely different character you know you don't, you don't want like a venom as the next spider-man you know you want them to be similar but different and this is an area where I feel that a lot of these successor characters that Marvel introduced in the 2010s as clear setup for the MCU when those actors stopped coming back really failed Falcon as Captain America. For a start, is a character who makes sense to be a successor to Cap. I mean, they'd already done Bucky, who was like the obvious choice, but Sam had been Cap's sidekick since the, uh, the 70s. He's well established by this point. You know, this is like a Robin taking over as Batman. But he's also got a unique thing to bring to the Captain America mantle. It's something that makes Sam's stories different from Cap, both in terms of abilities and his stories. For the story, it's what does it mean for a black man to be Captain America? There's interesting story potential with that. And the other is the wings. So the fight scenes are going to be different from Steve just throwing the shield and whatnot to Sam being able to fly around. I mean, that's one of the things that's kind of worrying about the new Captain America film. Apparently it's been pushed back because the fight scenes aren't on par. And it's like you can do so much more with a guy who can fly around. Why the fuck are these fight scenes not on par with the prior ones? Anyway, but I felt Lady Thor doesn't do that. Again, you have the vulnerability aspect, but the more interesting part of th this whole story is with the original Thor, by this point going by Odinson, who loses his arm, is now using an axe, and he can't even use his own fucking name, and he's trying to figure out who Lady Thor is, and then he's basically exiled from his own persona. He's more interested than she is. And I felt that, in a similar vein to Sam being the obvious choice for Captain America, there would have been better potential with picking someone who is more closely affiliated with Thor and Asgard. You know, Jane is, is the love interest, but it's like, you, you know, you wouldn't really pick Pepper Potts to be the new Iron Man. You know, you, you want someone who can kind of do what their character does, but in a different way. So I, I always felt that a better pick would have been either Lady Sif or Valkyrie. And at the time the character was introduced, uh, Lady Thor was introduced in the comics, Valkyrie wasn't in the MCU yet. And even when she was introduced, she was a radically different character. And Sif was around and people liked her. I remember, but remember she was like pretty popular for fan casts for Wonder Woman because BVS wasn't out yet. You know, set her up to be the, the new Thor for the films would make sense. And also both could do something cool and interesting combat wise. Because again, Lady Thor is just Thor, but a girl. And all she really brings to the fight scenes is Female villains are like, yo, I like what you're doing. You're, you're a feminist icon. I give up. And that's not even good. So imagine taking Valkyrie or Sif and having them merge their weapon with Mjolnir. So Sif, who uses a sword, has Mjolnir as the hilt and pommel of her sword. So she has a lightning sword. Some might say that's a little too different from the Thor concept with the hammer and that, but obviously the hammer would still be an option in addition to the sword. She could probably split them off and have them be separate as well. Valkyrie, of course, with her spear would have it be the hammer is on the end of it, so it's more like a, a big war hammer. And I just felt something like that would be more interesting fight-wise, because remember, the superhero comics, the fights are a big part of it. And I felt that was a, a logical thing to do to make these fights a bit more interesting compared to just the same thing but the character is like not quite as big and he's probably a little faster you know and then of course story-wise the whole thing of these people who have fought alongside Thor for probably centuries I think he's actually been in relationships with both how does 
them taking up Thor's power affect their relationships with Thor and everyone else in Asgard as opposed to this person who has very little connection to Asgard. I, it just made more sense to me to pick someone other than Jane Foster. And that was what the episode was going to be, but I didn't really have much of a solid direction to go with it. And th this episode existing and being the first one here tells you how long ago I came up with the idea. This would have been like, I think the first episode of Waste of Potential came out in January 2017. So this would have been early 2017 when I came up with it, back when this stuff mattered. <laughs> I mean, now it, it just does not matter at all. So the episode's not going to happen, but that's what it was going to be about. So this one is Batwoman. Basically, I was rather fond of the new 52 Batwoman book, which came into some problems when Kate Kane, Batwoman, proposed to her girlfriend, Maggie Sawyer, and she said yes, and so, yeah, we're going to have a big, big lesbian wedding. And then DC said, nah, you're not doing it. After they'd already released the issue, instead of saying, no, don't have her propose, it's afterwards they objected. And I don't think it was a homophobic thing. I mean, they also divorced Superman and Lois. Like, they, they separated them. So I think it was a case of they didn't want married superheroes, the same kind of bullshit that has been haunting Spider-Man for like 20 years now. The writer and an artist quit the book. The book went in a different direction afterwards with new people helming it. It was fine. It's just, it was... There were certain issues with the way things panned out were Kate, after breaking up with Maggie, is heartbroken. And then Nocturna, this vampire lady who, in prior continuities, for prior timelines, had actually been in a relationship with Bruce. It's not entirely clear if she is using her vampire hypnosis to make Kate think she's Maggie. Or if Kate's just tired and thinks it's Maggie, then gets a better look at her. But they end up having sex. And they enter an explicitly sexual relationship. And while they're together, Kate just can't say no to her. And so it gives very unfortunate fortunate implications that Kate has been forced into this sexual relationship. It's a bit, uh, you know, it, it, it has a, a certain vibe, a certain kind of, in, the vibe of certain intimate relationships that people should not have, let's say. I, I feel like that was why all of a sudden at the end of the book, it's like, oh no, Kate had a, a fetish for being dominated by, by a sexy vampire lady ever since she was a kid. It was just normal hypnosis rules. You can't be made to do stuff you, you don't want to do. And Kate just went along with it. And so it wasn't that thing. It was purely consensual. It's all okay. But Kate still needs to beat up this person because she's a bad guy. And then Kate doesn't do that. I think she even makes Kate attack her own sister briefly. But then her sister Alice just like punches Nocturna out. And then Kate's like, yeah, I'm going to go off and, and get back with Maggie. And then Detective Comics during Rebirth comes out. And it's like, nah, that didn't work out. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> Kate doesn't get to do anything during the finale. It's just her sister comes in and she's like, I figured out what this all is. Her sister who's been absent for like 20 issues just shows up and goes, yeah, I, I know what's going on. Here's what's actually happening. I'm going to deal with the villain. And it's really lame for the first solo book of any Batwoman to end this. Because that's the end of the book. There's like one other issue they had, which was um, an annual, which feels like it was just the so that Kate would have an opportunity to punch out Nocturna herself. But I felt like... There's a better way you could do this. My concept was implement a certain character who it's shocking has never interacted with Batwoman, despite the fact, the fact the way her sister is. Her sister is broken. She's a, a Harley Quinn-esque figure who is has a uh, severe mental issues and has styled her persona around Alice from Alice in Wonderland, a Batman spin-off character themed around Alice from Alice in Wonderland, who has never met the Mad Hatter. I actually had a lot of these ideas planned out the whole narrative conceived, but the episode's never going to get made. So here's basically what it would have been. The idea is that Kate hears from her father that Alice is on her way back to Gotham, is checking in to make sure she's okay. Kate's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Alice never showed up. Kate goes out to try and find her sister. And Nocturna is like, no, no, c come back to bed. And Kate's like, no. So that's like her defying Nocturna because this takes priority over the pleasure of the fantasy. And that's that's the first hint of the later revelation that it's all just consensual. Alice ran afoul of the Mad Hatter or sought him out herself, figuring she could help him because he's obsessed with finding Alice. She's themed after Alice. Maybe I can help him through his psychosis. And so Kate would find Alice in like the next issue. Like, There's a story in the Arkham Unhinged comic series, which is a bunch of random stories set in Arkham City. And one of the stories is that Batman finds a Mad Hatter tea party where he's got like Catwoman and Poison Ivy, a couple of other characters forced into a tea party playing these roles. Selina is dressed as the Cheshire Cat and whatnot. And so it's similar to that. Kate would come in, find Alice as Alice, maybe have to fight her a bit, knock out the Mad Hatter. They talk about it and Kate's like, well, what the hell happened? And Alice explains, I had these fantasies about being Alice and uh, be taking part in the tea party and, and all this stuff. So when he tried his mesmer 
terrorism stuff. She fell to it pretty easily because it allowed her to live out this fantasy. She compares it then to what Kate's fantasies are, like the whole vampire thing. And that triggers something in Kate's mind. She's like, oh, that's what's going on. Because like Kate has fallen so deep into the fantasy because of her loneliness. She embraced it so wholeheartedly. She didn't even realize she could break free. And now she realizes, oh, yes, I can. And so then she goes back and confronts Nocturna, brings Alice with her. Nocturna tries to turn Kate against Alice. It doesn't work. Kate punches her out. Alice call the cops, tie Nocturna up. I'm going to go get my life back in order. And she goes to find Maggie to get the relationship back on track. And so it'd be a way to have this obvious connection between these two Batman adjacent characters that are so obvious. Like it's, it's, it's absurd that in, in over a decade since Alice was introduced the way she was, that these two characters have never interacted as far as I'm aware. I mean, maybe they've interacted since I came up with the idea for the video and it would have been completely redundant, but it does that and also allows Kate to actually get to play a part in her own finale, not just Kate doesn't know what's going on, someone else explains it and then beats the villain. It's Kate figures it out herself and then beats the villain herself. So it's a more triumphant finale for her story, right? The Mad Hatter also had an episode which was based on Arkham Knight. So in Arkham Knight, one of the, I think it was one of the DLC missions, you find out about these three cops who've gone missing. And so you go looking for them and you find two of them in their police cars and they're wearing masks themed around Alice in Wonderland. And so he gets to the third car and the cop is not there. He has to track down where the cop is and then you end up in this really neat scenario. A lot of the most memorable parts of the Arkham games are when you get the trippy stuff like the Scarecrow bits in the first game. Bruce is on top of like a pop-up book and like the pages come over and Batman has to like grapple through the, the book pages through the holes to get to the next part and it's going through the different games. So here's Arkham Asylum, then here's Arkham City, and a couple of others. And then the finale is, you're fighting the, this one guy who's attacking you in, I think it's the White Rabbit Mask. You beat him, but if you use any of the instant takedown moves, Batman kills him. And then Mad Hatter's like, oh, you killed him, Batman. And then Bruce has like a mental breakdown. The Hatter's goal of turning him into his Alice bodyguard thing has been achieved. The reason this is connected, not, it's not just because of the Mad Hatter, it's because I've had this idea that Arkham Knight's story with the, a lot of the villain stuff would be a lot more interesting and more plausible because the amount of stuff Bruce does in one night is just absurd. Would have been a lot more interesting, I think, if they had actually brought in the Bat family to do more of the stuff like th this character is dealt with by Nightwing, this character dealt with by Robin. One of my ideas was bring in Batwoman. Because Kate does exist in the setting. Like, there, there is a voice message she has left for Bruce. I think it's at Wayne Tower. So she does exist in the setting. And, and it's, it's even suggested that she and Maggie are going to get married. Like, it's a big fuck you to DC. Like, yeah, fuck you guys. These versions get to be happy at least. So I thought, wouldn't it have been really interesting if it was Kate instead doing this mission? I actually wrote this story out because I thought it was a really interesting premise. So I do actually have that as a fan fiction you can read. Because Maggie Sawyer is a cop. She was originally a Superman supporting character, introduced right after Crisis, and then she moved to Gotham in like the mid-2000s, and that's where she met Kate. So imagine if one of the missing cops is Maggie. And so Maggie has been captured by the Hatter. She's the last one, the one who isn't in the car. And so Kate's like really getting worried. Where is she? She's not with the others. It did have to do something. And then she, of course, is the White Rabbit, the one that you have potential to kill. I feel like the idea of the Alice bodyguard amalgamated role makes a bit more sense with a woman compared to Batman. As far as I know, the Hatter has never, in his search for Alice, has never actually gone after a man to fill that role. And so I feel like having it be Batwoman makes a lot more sense. You can tie the whole missing cop thing in with Maggie, and it's even more heartbreaking if she actually kills her, because then she's killed her girlfriend or fiancé or even wife, depending on how far along the relationship is. And it's not just a cop. It's not even a named character, like someone that Bruce knows. It's just some cop. So what if it was this specific character relevant to the character we're playing as? What is depicted by the book pages would have to change because Kate wasn't in Arkham Asylum or Arkham City. And so it would be stuff that ties into her backstory. So one could be like the diner where her sister and mother were killed when they were all taken hostage by terrorists. You know, st stuff like that. But otherwise it would be most of the same, just with a bit more of an emotional resonance to it because it's got the focus on Kate and Maggie as opposed to Bruce and some cop who, yeah, it's sad that Bruce killed someone. It's sad that a cop died who was just trying to protect Gotham and he got murdered by a, a mind-controlled Batman. Kind of like what we're seeing in, 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 in Suicide Squad game, actually. Yeah, uh, I think it would have been a bit more interesting. And there's others along those lines. I actually laid out what all the characters would have. Like Each character would have three different quests. She would also fight Professor Pig alongside Maggie. I think Nightwing was, just, was the one going after Two-Face and Penguin and also uh, mentoring Azrael and stuff like that. 
that's the basic setup for what I, I thought would be an interesting idea, but, you know, didn't end up making the episode. Spider-Man Web of Shadows. It ties into a little theory I have about how this game came about, because a lot of the ideas in it, the whole morality system in the game, and the big focus on symbiotes with the black suit and different fighting styles and whatnot, to me it just felt like it would have made way more sense if the game was about Venom. So I always wondered, was the game maybe conceived as a Venom spin-off? Because this was, you know, like a year or two after Spider-Man 3 came out, the black suit and Venom were really in at the time. And so the idea of making a game about the symbiote expanding on what the Spider-Man 3 game did make sense but the morality system is just weird why is the morality system for spider-man why is there the potential for spider-man to drop kick black cat off a building to a death by accident that, you know it's just weird but if it was a venom game and it's about venom treading the line between villain and anti-hero and he has two styles one that's a more spider-man-ish punching and a more aggressive teeth and claws style it would have made more sense obviously venom as the antagonist would be replaced by carnage but a game all about the symbiote invasion centering on venom against carnage with a morality system where venom is trying to ride the line between being an anti-hero that spider-man can approve of that's the word that spider-man could approve of or just being a super villain it makes a lot more sense than spider-man in that role you know so this one's about emma frost it ties specifically into Generation X, I can tell because the background is Generation X. I'm not sure what I had planned for this exactly. I think it might tie into my ideas because I, I wrote this story years ago called Decimation X, which is basically around a little headcanon that came up with because Emma Frost, when she started to become a good guy, a big part of her characterization is she is very protective of her students. If you fuck with her students, she'll probably kill you. And so when Decimation happens, when most of the mutants lose their powers, Chamber loses his and Chamber will die without his powers. He doesn't have internal organs. So when he loses his powers, he's just a crater and he's just dying and somehow he survives. And we find out in the miniseries Generation M, that is because Wolverine, Cyclops, and Beast, all of them together brought this life support machine to, to save him. Three of the most important X-Men, one of whom, Cyclops, is the headmaster of the Xavier Institute at that time alongside Emma as the headmistress. When we see how the mansion reacts to the whole depowering thing in New X-Men, it's chaos. Emma has to get to Cerebro and just use the powers to put all the students to sleep to stop the panic. She had to do that and then still had time to save Chamber. It would have made so much sense to go with my headcanon idea that Emma is there thinking, okay, students, 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 who's, who could really be in trouble if they're dead? Oh God, Jonah would fucking die. She tracks him down and is like, Scott, you fucking go to Chamber right now. You will save his life. And so he, he Wolverine and, and Beast go right away and miraculously they managed to save him. I think that was what I was going to do an episode about. Looking back at it, I don't think there's really much point to it because really it's just a case of this relatively small detail would have been neat to actually explain that way to tie into Emma's story and uh, characterization at that time. That's, that's kind of it. Injustice 2. Now you might think, wait, didn't you already do an Injustice 2 one? Yes. The plan was to do two episodes for it. One was going to be Injustice 2 as it is, as a sequel to Injustice 1. This one was going to be Injustice 2 as a sequel to my original Injustice 1 alternate concept where Batman was the villain. And so this would have been, as you can guess from the thumbnail, a version of Injustice 2 where Brainiac comes in and he's doing his thing, but Batman is the villain. Or maybe it would have been about just whatever the hell I wanted to do, whether Brainiac's involved or not. I don't remember if I had any specific ideas for it, other than obviously, you know, Bruce has to be brought out to be the tactician. So while Superman is released in the actual game to be the powerhouse to take down Brainiac, Bruce would be the one brought out to be the strategist. That, I feel, wouldn't have worked as well with Brainiac as the antagonist, because Brainiac, at least it, it, the way Injustice does it, he is tied to Krypton. I think a lot of other continuities do that. I'm not sure if that's a core part of Brainiac, but, you know, he's often associated with Krypton. But set aside our differences, let's bring out Superman so he can go ahead and fight this guy who is destroyed his home planet. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. With Batman as the villain being brought out, bringing him out as a strategist makes sense, but it's dealing with something he has really no idea how to deal with. And so it would work better if it was a different villain, like, say, Ra's al Ghul. They put aside the differences to deal with him. It wouldn't necessarily work as well as the actual thing, because Brainiac is clearly more of a physical threat. Like, Superman versus Brainiac makes a lot more sense than Superman versus Ra's. Like, how much can you really do with that realistically without making it hella contrived? I don't know. I don't know, I can't leave, I don't know why I even said hella. I just did. Jesus, I'm dying. So that was the idea for the Injustice 2 other episode, and you can kind of see why I never made it. I think the one I did on the actual Injustice 2 is actually one of the better wasted potentials I did. So I think that one just 
on its own to be my entire coverage of Injustice 2 makes sense. Although there were some other Injustice 2 episodes I had planned. And let's see if one of those will be the next one I find. Yes, it is. <laughs> Reverse Flash. So this, I actually wrote some endings for the Premier skins once because they didn't get endings i thought well what could their endings be in injustice 2 and one of the ones i came up with was reverse flash the idea of him going back in time and stopping all this from happening stopping the destruction of metropolis and superman becoming a dictator because the whole thing is he is a living paradox he can't go back to his own time because the timeline has changed too much so he goes back stops what happens to superman and he's like okay things are stable fuck this i'm going home and then when he gets there there's a statue of him around like the flash museum dedicated to the reverse flash the hero who saved metropolis he's like you know this this hero thing is not bad at all and he can maybe become a hero of his own time like a new generation flash and i think that was all it was going to be we have to remember a lot of these uh, concepts were conceived before i started doing episodes about multiple characters that are not completely connected you know so we've got the johnny and sonya and jacks one those three character stories are heavily intertwined in that episode. It would be a while before I did stuff like the MK11 Retcon Backstories episode, which is about like six characters whose original backstories, the Retcon backstories, or my reimagined backstories, are not connected at all. So these would have all been grouped together, I think, if we were actually making them. This would have been like a two, three minute episode. What if Reverse Flash had an ending where he goes through time and, and saves everyone? I don't know what the Harley one would have been. I think... The use of Harley's alternate costume from Injustice 1 may be as suggestive of what it was going to be. It might have been about the Zero Hour comic, because that was about that story from her perspective, but with her motivation and personality more in line with where she was in the comics at the time, rather than the way she's in the game. Because in the game, she's just still a fanatical devotee of the Joker, whereas in the comics, she'd kind of moved on. And so she's depicted as being under duress. And I did plan to cover that in a video, whether that be as part of the Injustice critique or a separate thing but I ended up just, just scrapping the whole thing so maybe that's what this would have been that seems the most likely based on the use of this specific costume I mean I may, maybe just didn't have a render for Injustice 2 version well, that was unlikely because I had the reverse flash one before this so it probably was based on zero hour but there's not really much to say other than the comic contradicts things a bit if, if I'm ever going to cover that it'll just be to discuss how the comics are clearly a different continuity compared to the games and that's kind of it Starfire, it was just about the fact that she doesn't have any intros where she confronts Cyborg about joining Evil Superman regime. That was kind of it, because for some reason she just doesn't have any. Because Starfire is kind of two different characters in this, the same way that Johnny and Cassie are, where if you look at how she's written in intros, she's mostly just like a more comic accurate version. Whereas the way she's written in her ending, she's written as if she is the Teen Titans cartoon version. Why is she written in her cyborg intros not talking about the injustice continuity she's a part of? Whereas with Damian Wayne, she is. She's like, you killed Dick. And he's like, it was an accident. You know, that's that's good. I wish she had stuff that, like that with Cyborg. And I think I was going to propose that she could also have some stuff with Raven if she was added. Uh, but that was all it was going to be. It was going to be, why doesn't Starfire call out Cyborg for joining the regime? I think she does with some other characters. I think there's another, another character somewhere in the game that she does call out. Like, why are you joining Superman? Don't you know what he, di he did to Connor? What's wrong with you? Avengers vs. X-Men focus around Psylocke and Captain Britain. The basic thing was... Avengers vs. X-Men is one of the more contrived super... Well, most... I'd say one of the more... Like, they're all contrived. All these hero versus hero big stories are all incredibly contrived. This one is... The X-Men want to use Hope Summers, who is like the, the only mutant born after Decimation, to harness the power of the Phoenix Force so that she can bring back mutants. And the Avengers are like, no, 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 you're meddling with powers you don't understand. And it's like, how are the X-Men the one who don't understand what the Phoenix can do? Really. And it's all just this weird thing that honestly felt like it was meant to be an allegory for the X-Men movie film rights. Like the Avengers are the good guys, the X-Men are the bad guys, the X-Men are Fox. They don't understand what they've got. They're ruining everything. They should give this thing over. To, they should stop trying to steal this thing from Marvel and Disney. Give it back to them who are represented by the Avengers. That's the vibe I always got from it. But it's one of those where everyone picks their side. And it's quite telling that the two X-Men most heavily associated with the Avengers, Wolverine and Beast, side with the Avengers. There's, and there's no conflict. Unless there was like a tie-in that, that where, where Wolverine's like, damn, I'm really conflicted about this whole thing. Then there's just nothing there. Wolverine has nothing to say and neither does Beast. And neither does Psylocke and Captain Britain who are twins and those two are never actually never actually meet each other because Psylocke is part of the ground forces while Brian is off in space trying to hold off the Phoenix Force so he gets taken out, out with everyone else. And then even when the two sides come together to fight Cyclops when he's possessed by the Phoenix... Even then, the two never interact. So I thought it would have been really interesting if the two twins would encounter each other in the ground forces. And they're like, this needs to stop. 
Like, we're all just fighting each other. It's not going to go anywhere. And so they, along with Wolverine, Beast, and some other characters associated with both sides, would form a third faction trying to stop the fighting. They're like, we're not taking part in this stupid fight. We're going to be either a neutral party, like the X-Men were during Civil War, or we're going to be actively fighting the other sides to try and stop the fighting, or negotiate with them to stop the fighting. There's a weird underutilization of these two as a duo, for some reason. So, <laughs> from Brian's perspective... His older twin sister, you know, she finds out she's a mutant, so she goes off to join the X-Men, dies, then she comes back. By the time she comes back, she has done the body swap and is now Asian. She's now Japanese ethnically. And we never see Brian's reaction to it. <laughs> we never see what he thinks about it. Like, the next time we see them, they're just sparring. There's not even, like, an offhand comment about, oh, that new body is, like, really enhance your physical abilities or something like that. It's just, to this day, we have no idea what Brian thought when his twin sister came home, his white blonde twin sister came home, and she was Japanese. <laughs> they need to do more with these characters. And it's one of the things that hopefully they'll do in the MCU, but at the same time, I don't want the MCU touching these characters because I like both these characters a lot. And the MCU's dog shit right now, so I don't, I don't want it to ruin these two characters, especially since Betsy has historically not done well in adaptations. <laughs> I was going to do one for Incredibles 2. I don't remember much of the idea. Came up with it in the cinema watching the film and then, I don't know. It, it had something to do with the kids playing a big part. I remember that much. Obviously, it was related specifically to the whole screen slaver controlling Helen and the other heroes thing. Hence the use of these specific images. And you can tell from the background that that's not the finalized background. It was just, that was just a placeholder while I made the thumbnail. But I don't know where it was going to go. This one connects to the Batwoman and Mad Hatter ones a bit too, because this one is Maggie. It's mostly just going to be me ranting, I guess, about the fact that Maggie in the Arrowverse on Supergirl is just not Maggie Sawyer. They changed her race, which is one thing, which at least they did something with that. Like They, they connected it into, she was rejected by her parents for being gay, and it ties into not her, her dad being homophobic per se, but because he's like, I worked hard to make sure you can live a normal life in America, you are ruining that which is an interesting way to take that idea. The real issue is the fact that, you have to keep in mind, at this time, the most recent comic story involving Maggie in a substantial way was Batwoman, where the whole reason those two broke up, the big one was, Maggie has a daughter. She had a daughter before she realized she was gay, and she divorced her husband. For some reason, his name is James Buchanan, which just makes me think of James Buchanan Barnes, Bucky. I, I'm sure it's not intentional, so it's probably just a weird coincidence. I don't know. He is very homophobic. Kate, this famous socialite in Gotham, is publicly dating Maggie Sawyer from the GCPD. He finds out and he's like, I don't want my daughter being raised by a couple of gays. A dyke? Oh no! And so he tries to get sole custody of their daughter. The stress of that, along with planning the wedding, learning that Kate is Batwoman, and also being a cop in Gotham, it all piles on. And eventually, Kate's like, look, Jim, I'll make a deal with you. I'll stop dating Maggie if you let her have full custody. And he's like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And because Kate did that behind Maggie's back, Maggie has a complete falling out with her and just refuses to talk to her, which sends her into that depressive spiral that leads to the whole thing with Nocturna. It's a, it's a whole thing. I think Maggie's been cut out a bit here. I, th I think, yeah, part, part of her left arm's been cut off. That's weird. The whole story is tied around the fact she has a kid. Now, in the Supergirl show, she is partially to thank for Kara's adopted sister, Alex, realizing she's gay. She is her first girlfriend. But then they break up because Alex wants kids and Maggie doesn't. A character whose most recent story was all about her and her child doesn't want kids. She doesn't act, look like her. She doesn't act like her. She has completely different motivations. Honestly, she would work better as Renee Montoya. It feels like they wanted Renee Montoya, but couldn't use her because she was part of Gotham. Or it was felt it would be really weird to put Renee Montoya in Metropolis instead of Gotham. It was a weird direction to go. Like, yeah, we're going to break up these two characters and the one who in the comics is a gay mom is going to be the one who doesn't want kids. I, 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 mm. And the last comic one was going to be Crisis on Infinite Earths, the Arrowverse version. Yeah, I think it was just kind of trying to clean things up because there's a lot of stuff that's done this unnecessary, like first or second episode of it. That f potential future from uh, Legend of Tomorrow Season 1 where Oliver is retired as a Green Arrow because he lost his arm and we have... Uh, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Diggle. And we, <laughs> and we have John Diggle. His son is the new Green Arrow. It's like that that wasn't a potential future that the that the heroes prevented. That was just an alternate universe they jumped into and didn't realize. That was a dumb retcon. And I feel like it's just there to give closure to that version of Oliver. But I feel like it would have made way more sense to do something radically different. Like, you know, Stephen Amell is stepping away from the Arrowverse at the end of Crisis. So they're going to kill off Oliver. 
If we're going to do this alternate universe the characters jump into, where we get to see a version of him, why not do something more interesting? Like, what if the universe they go to is a more classic Green Arrow universe? What if Oliver Queen of that universe is the more comic accurate one? He's got the goatee and he's got and he's got the more quippy personality, married to his version of Laurel, and it was like, whoa, she calls off Dinah, that's weird. And it's a more comic accurate version of the Green Arrow, kind of what people may have wanted Stephen Amell to portray rather than Batman with a, with a bow. That's kind of what Arrow is. So that would have been fun. Another idea would have been that the universe where Kevin Conroy is playing a live action Bruce Wayne who has retired from being Batman after he killed Superman and a bunch of other heroes. But how about instead of being a dark and gritty version that gets kind of shoved by Kate and then like fucking breaks his back and dies or whatever the fuck. What if instead we paired him with the 90s Flash show and said this is the Batman from that universe. A Batman from the 90s alongside the Flash from the 90s. Some other notable actors from 90s DC productions. We had the Birds of Prey universe scene briefly. That one had Mark Hamill voice the Joker for a flashback. Why not have this be what Bruce was like was in that universe? You know, why bring in the, the most iconic voice of him? Maybe the most iconic actor that only really competed with by Adam West. If you're going to bring him in to play him in a live action for the first time, why play a, a fallen version? And not a fallen version who gets redemption. Like he stays to hold off enemies so Kate can escape before that universe is destroyed. Like Thomas Wayne in The Button. No, no, no. It, it, it's, it's, it's just some bullshit where he kills some villains, kills some heroes, and then Kate pushes him and he's like cyborg legs fucking explode or whatever and he just dies. Way to waste him, guys. They, they waste a lot of stuff, but there's some stuff that's treated with way more reverence. Like Brandon Routh as Superman gets a, a lot of play, even though people didn't really like that movie that much. It's mostly just because they had him around because he was playing Ray Palmer in the Arrowverse. So let's have him play Superman again, which is a neat idea, but they didn't really do much with it. And, and they put him in the Kingdom Come outfit. That could have been the same universe that this Bruce is from, this, this old broken Batman. Make it a Kingdom Come-ish universe. You know, there's a lot they could have done. And I think Crisis was overall fine, but there's just these weird things they did. A lot of it was just padding. Like, a lot of the stuff didn't need to be there, and it's just kind of weird. I also probably would have axed the final episode. You know, instead of it being like, here's the penultimate episode, the Crisis ends and everything, and we're, now we're in a shared, in the single, like, New Earth, and that's the one that's gonna be used for the future of the Arrowverse. I don't even know how the Arrowverse is still going, personally. It's a whole episode about that, the aftermath of that, which ends with the anti-monitors just coming back and then getting beaten up in a, in a parking lot. Like, I... You know, it, it kind of lowers the stakes a bit. Like, you really imagine if Infinity War is like, oh, Thanos gets beaten, and then Endgame's like, well, here's the aftermath of that. And Thanos just comes back and he's just like shows up in like a car park somewhere in like Dover and then fucking Captain America just fucking punches the shit out of him. It would be funny, but it'd be fucking lame. You know, they were really trying to ape the MCU. I mean, a way to waste the potential on how the crisis was basically structured, just like Infinity War and Endgame. But there's just weird stuff they did. I feel it could have been handled better. And ultimately, that would have been an episode, but some of the stuff is just because it gets pushed back so far. There's not much point. There's not much point making a wasted potential on the fucking finale of the Arrowverse at a time when no one gives a shit about the Arrowverse. It's dying. It's almost done. If not done already, and I just didn't notice. The whole event was like three years ago. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the kind of the kind of reason why some of this stuff is in this particular format, where I'm just explaining this stuff. I've got more to discuss in, in other ones. I've got some MK ones, Dynasty and Samurai Warriors ones. Oh, that, those ones are mainly not... Those ones are mostly not going to get made because Dynasty and Samurai Warriors videos just don't do too well on, on the channel, so no one would even watch them. But I have some cool ideas for them. So hopefully you'll at least watch the scrapped episodes where I basically lay it all out briefly. That'll probably just be with the other game ones, but depends how long they are. I mean, just these few DC ones and Marvel ones, that, that would have been like 40 minutes. I mean, that, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. There's going to be more of these where I just lay this stuff out. I think this type of video where I just lay out, here's some, some things that's never going to get made, will be valuable for a lot of content creators where you can just say, okay, it didn't work out for whatever reason. I'm just going to explain this so you guys can know about that. And then it can move on instead of just having this script, this partially written script or this concept, just gathering dust and not amounting to anything. So that's the thing. Hopefully you guys will stick around for the next one. And hopefully when I transition from whatever clothes I'm wearing, when I record the next time into this for you know, the Dead Rising 4 one and the other one, it won't be too jarring because I recorded those now, but they're not going to go in this episode. So stay tuned for those. If you want to see about how I would fix Dead Rising 4, because God knows that game needs fixing. K killed the franchise and the studio, I'm pretty sure. Jesus.